Why in the world would anyone deep energy retrofit a nine-year-old house? Am I nuts? Well, yeah, but let me see if I can explain. Queenstown has hot summers and cold, windy winters, and often will experience literally four seasons in a day. But for us, we prefer to keep the weather extremes squarely outside when we are at home. Built in 2014, I think the house is stylish and modern, with some innovative tech and actually some better than average materials. The tragedy here is, this house could have performed so much better, I mean really well, if not for a handful of pretty short-sighted cost-cutting choices made by the builder. Choices that, maddeningly, would have had a huge impact on the comfort and the operating cost of the house. So which upgrades did we put on our short list? We assessed the possibilities based on feasibility and of course cost. Saving money via energy savings can be a bit of a long game, depending on the types of upgrades. But to some extent, that is kind of missing the point. Did this guy calculate the return on investment of his new jacuzzi? Do fuzzy dice give you better gas mileage? Did they make the car go faster? Could they become an insulating fashion trend? At some point it comes down to what is your thermal comfort worth to you? without having to crank up the thermostat and pay through the nose. So if I had to pick the most disappointing parts of the build, the most hideous squander was the window and door package chosen by the builder. For a fractional increase in the overall construction budget, these frames could have been thermally insulated. There's a very good reason the fins and heat exchanger are made from aluminum. It's one of the best conductors of heat among all the metals. The downside to that is it's also the best conductor of cold. But aluminum is a very popular material choice for window manufacturers because it's so durable against the elements. Fortunately, there is a very simple solution that nearly all window manufacturers offer. The thermal transfer through a window frame can be greatly reduced with a simple insulating nylon insert, commonly referred to as a thermal brake. But if you don't ask for it, then you get what the builder chooses, which predictably will be the least cost option. But once they're manufactured, and shipped, and installed into your house, there simply is no additive retrofit solution for these windows and doors that can boost the performance of the frame. Yeah, plastic film, probably not gonna find pictures of that in the builder's glossy brochures. Realistically, every window and door would have to be removed and replaced. To briefly unpack what that means, throw a $30,000 window and door package into the rubbish, launch a ton of embodied carbon into the atmosphere that it took to smelt the aluminum, fire the glazing, assemble the units, ship them to a warehouse, and then ship them to the site. Add that to the cost of the carbon debt to haul them away and landfill them in an overfilled dump somewhere. Given the relatively young age of the house and the expense and waste to rip them out and replace them, we won't be upgrading these anytime soon. Probably never. This brings into sharper focus the insanity of installing minimum legally permissible units in the context of carbon reduction targets. The nexus of the whole retrofitting journey was the sudden death of the underfloor heat system. The builder's choice of a budget-friendly heat pump was making a loud noise and accumulating ice on the coils. You see a pattern beginning to emerge here. Most homes, with some rare exceptions, that are built in speculative developments, are typically not built to your specifications. Instead, they're usually built to a specification that saves the builder money up front and passes on any long-term maintenance consequences to you, the buyer. The broken heat pump manufacturer no longer had a presence in New Zealand, so 
full replacement was really the only option. And so began the snowball effect. From the beginning, the original unit had always been quite loud and was poorly situated too close to the bedroom window. The new unit is much quieter, but to play it safe, we decided to take this opportunity to relocate the new unit to here. But since the underfloor heat tubing enters the slab here, we would need to extend the tubing around to our new location here. It was decided we should bury the extended tubing for aesthetics as well as protection from damage. We were also able to wrap the tubes with a ton more insulation since it was going into a trench anyway. As soon as the digging began, some significant and interesting problems began to emerge. The vapor barrier under the concrete was turned up at all the edges, and with no slab edge insulation acting as a counter flashing, it was actually scooping rainwater and channeling it under the foundation edges, thereby reversing the function and intent of the membrane. I was able to download the house plans from the town website. The foundation detail as drawn by the engineer had been slightly changed. Rather than leaving the membrane level to the ground under the edges, like this or this, the builder chose to roll the sheets up the formwork like this. This caused two separate headaches. The vapor barrier was acting as a rainwater collection pond, unfortunately not in the useful way. Instead of isolating the slab from the ground to keep it dry, the turned up membrane here was accumulating rainwater in the concrete, like a sponge in a bathtub. The only thing worse than a cold slab is a cold, wet slab. High moisture levels. Cold condensing surfaces. Inadequate ventilation. And blue diamonds! Part of a complete breakfast. With a wood frame house. It's all the right ingredients for mold. Bit by bit, it was becoming clear why a retrofit wasn't so crazy after all. I would have liked to think that this was a one-off detail on this house only, but strolling around the neighborhood, it was clear that this detail is repeated on several other homes in this area. This all could have been made moot if the perimeter had simply been covered with an insulating panel. The building code doesn't really specify assembly details. It only gives minimum R-value requirements for the assembly type. Details, methods, and means are left up to the architect or engineer. Specifications can range from exquisitely detailed diagrams based on sound science to controversial specifications or those with few details at all. But as this example points out, even the best specification can be worthless if it's ignored. The raft slab or Waffle slab is a pretty common foundation type all around the world. Large foam blocks, or in some cases, molded plastic cubes, are laid out in a grid pattern to create channels for reinforcing steel and concrete. The primary role of the foam blocks under the slab is to displace concrete, but since, for structural integrity, they are stopped short of the edges, they're pretty ineffective as insulation. That's because about 80% of the energy loss of a slab is at the edges. To my mind, a house with no floor insulation is kind of like a beer cooler with a big chunk missing out of it. Oh, it's ruined! The retrofit panels we chose were reasonably priced. The panels, adhesive, paint, and a few other supplies worked out to about $65 per lineal meter, including tax and shipping. So about $3,500 all in. The house is about 140 square meters, excluding the garage. And it's a fairly simple add-on solution, but the work is pretty labor-intensive. And so this gets a rating of hard, but in our opinion, necessary. We ordered samples of a few different types of panels. All were pre-finished. Some required a final stucco touch-up, but the insulfound system came with its own primed cement board surface that was by far the most durable shell we could find. The vertical shiplap ends was a nice touch. Panels come in three meter lengths. Once they got a coat of paint out in the garage, we cracked on with the character building work. A bit of good fortune was the half meter wide bed of gravel that the builder had laid down all the way around the house. It was probably easier than digging up clumps of turf. Now comes the second headache I mentioned. When the concrete was poured, 
Some places bulge the plastic under the form boards like a cement hernia. Not the end of the world, but it did make for some extra work to fit the insulation panels over the blobs. We filled in those areas with a bit of can foam to be sure we're getting insulation all the way to the bottom of the slab everywhere possible. Just before installing the panels, we noticed that the bottom edge of the wall air barrier membrane was not sealed to the slab edges anywhere. So we seized the opportunity to tape it to the relatively smooth slab edge prior to installing the retrofit panels. We were able to purchase a Tescon tape product that was compatible with the original Extasana membrane and adhered amazingly well to the concrete slab edge. Ten months later now and it is still perfectly adhered where it's accessible along the garage slab edges. Unfortunately, my blower door kit is 10,000 miles away, so I can't tell you how much impact this had on air leakage, but it certainly can't hurt, and it should make insect critter proofing a bit more robust. The panels were reasonably easy to cut and fit with basic tools. However, you must use a special cement board blade. Standard circular saw blades just won't cut it. Be sure to use a fresh blade when cutting the panel miters. Getting the miters to look good takes a little patience, especially if there are any imperfections in the concrete near the corners. We began installing panels in the corner where the heat pump was going, so that we could get out of the mechanic's way as quickly as possible. Establish the outside miters first, and then add the panels in between, even if that means adding one more joint in the middle. Dry fit the pieces using the wedges to check your alignment of joints before you commit to gluing. Clean the slab with a stiff bristle brush. Apply two plump blobs of adhesive, high and low, at 30 centimeter centers. Avoid continuous lines that could trap moisture. Apply fatter blobs if the concrete surface is rough or uneven. Critical warning here, be certain that the glue you use is safe on the foam you choose. Many glues will just melt the foam. A little trick you might find useful when you're ready to glue. Take a piece of twine, make a loop at one end, and put a roofing nail through the loop. Then lift the panel with one hand and find the center of gravity. Then shove the nail into that spot into the bottom of the panel between the foam and the cement board. Leave the twine behind the panel to help you suspend it and pull it up against the wall cladding air channel. With the 30 millimeter thick panels, there's still plenty of room for it to vent. If you ask for the thicker 50 millimeter panels, you may need to tape on temporary spacers to keep the air gap clear for the cladding vent. Once you glue the panels on, Use the wooden shim wedges to apply pressure until the glue sets up. Plan to leave the shims on overnight to be on the safe side. There was no appetite or budget for cutting through the concrete patios on either side of the house, so we just fitted the panels around those. We'll have to live with some thermal bridging at those locations. About halfway through the job, we got a cold snap overnight, which presented an opportunity to take some thermal images, which were pretty cool, literally about 5 degrees difference in surface temperature between the slab and the new panels. Look at the gap where the can foam leaves off, clearly having a significant impact. Wrapping up and backfilling, I decided to lay down so-called weed mat. I actually folded the matting back onto itself to create a double layer. Long story short, don't waste your money, it's pretty close to worthless. Blades of grass were poking through in a matter of weeks just laughing at me. Someday I'll go back and remove the gravel and replace it with pavers with gel sand joints. Inselfound do say that you can have turf right up against the panels, but I wanted to be sure of a high drying potential with the gravel. Ten months later, presumably the trapped water in the slab edge has now dissipated. Gone is the condensation on the floor tiles on cold nights. If you found this interesting, check out this short video about the other energy retrofitting we did, attic insulation and some ventilation system improvements we made. Sure, this is not the deepest energy retrofit that's ever been done. For a deeper dive, check out this video. But we definitely learned some interesting things about housing in New Zealand, and we just might have staved off significant moisture-related damage. Tap here to check out the other energy retrofitting measures we did here. Thanks for watching.